Hey, what's going on, everyone? And welcome to episode nine of the Alec Walt Show. I'm your host, Alec Walt, alongside another very special guest. And today we're talking New York Giants football. For those of you wondering why there's no body's flag hanging behind me, I am doing this show live from Delray Beach, Florida, here for my cousin's wedding. Congratulations, Becky and Chuck. I cannot wait to see you guys get married this weekend. So again, I mentioned the New York Giants. What we're going to do today is we're going to talk about the Giants last year, some of the moves they made this offseason, and the names you should keep an eye on before the 2021 NFL Draft, which is one week from today. Joining me to talk about all things New York Giants is Lance Meadow, the pregame and postgame broadcaster for the Giants. Lance, welcome to the show. I appreciate you joining me. Well, thanks so much for having me, Alec. Appreciate it. Look forward to the conversation here. Awesome. Well, as most of you, all our listeners know, including yourself, is I'm a New England Patriots guy. You're team, the New York Giants, took uh, hired a coach, your, your new head coach, Joe Judge, is a former New England Patriots assistant. Just before we get started, give me a breakdown about jo- Judge's performance in, week, in year one. Well, I think that the expectations weren't necessarily overwhelmingly high because of the fact that he was inheriting a team with a lot of question marks, which was well documented specifically on the defensive side of the ball. And then if you remember, Alec, there was all of that chatter leading into training camp, making the guys run laps. He's going to rub them the wrong way. He's not Bill Belichick. And I think what happened at the end-all, be-all is the fact that guys bought into what he was selling because he personalized his relationships with each and every one of them. And I think that they liked his philosophy. They understood that he was a guy that was going to focus on fundamentals and pretty much give it to the players straight, which I think is important, as opposed to, you know, put on a dog and pony show and think that the guys are just going to follow you into battle. So I think as the season progressed, the veterans, this roster overall was relatively young. And I think that helped his cause because you had a lot of players adjusting to life in the NFL, just like Joe Judge was adjusting to life as an NFL head coach. So I think overall, things went relatively smoothly. And the team was in the thick of things because it was a down year overall for the NFC East. So I think like anything else, based on the moves they made this year, the expectations increase, and the goal is to continue the development of this young nucleus and see where this team could go in year two under the tutelage of Joe Judge. Awesome. We talk about that young nucleus. It's led by quarterback Daniel Jones, who last year was in his second season in the NFL. I know he didn't play the entire season, but just tell me about the growth of Jones at the quarterback position. Well, I think what happened was – You gave him multiple offensive coordinators. You give him multiple schemes early in his career. There's going to be ups and downs, Alec, with respect to that. I could point to Alex Smith, who just retired. He had six offensive coordinators in his first seven seasons. Look at Drew Locke, who incidentally, who's with Pat Shermer, by the way, who helped draft and groom Daniel Jones. He now has had five offensive coordinators in six years, going back to his days at Missouri. So, When everybody asks about Daniel Jones, it's not an excuse, Alec. It's just the bottom line is, factually speaking, if you put your quarterback in that circumstance and you expect him to all of a sudden become a Hall of Famer overnight, it's just, it's absolutely ridiculous. So I think with Daniel Jones' stability, okay, that's the one thing that I would continue to preach. This is going to be, for the first time since going back to his Duke days, where he's going to have the same offense to work with. What's on top of him now is, can he do a better job protecting the football? And he did a really good job of that in the second half of last year. If you look at the last eight games compared to the first eight games, it was night and day. So that's something that's on him. The onus is on him. And then the second thing is, with them improving the roster, the offensive personnel around Daniel Jones, can he now take advantage of that group? Those are the two things that are on him. But as far as what the team can provide, It's stability. And I think what's promising for Daniel Jones is he's going to be working with Jason Garrett for the second straight year, as opposed to this game of musical chairs where it's, you know, in and out trying to adjust to a new offensive scheme. I don't think that's good for, I'm not just talking about Daniel Jones. I don't think that's good for any young quarterback in the NFL. So you have a lot of movable parts. I think that's turned now into stability, the decision-making of Daniel Jones and what he's working with from an offensive standpoint. You hope that this helps him make this step in the right direction this year. So you talked about stability in the coaching staff. Jason Garrett, like you mentioned, is the offensive coordinator for the second straight year. Just talk about how those two work together in that first year and how they can improve going into year two. Well, I think the key for year one was getting to know each other without the benefit of an offseason, Alec. That was the biggest challenge that I think both parties had that we can't dismiss and we can't overlook. You're dealing with a quarterback that's still in the developmental phase and you're dealing with 
Jason Garrett, who's a polished head coach, but once again, he had to get used to this new personnel. So you don't necessarily have to worry about that as much entering this offseason. I think that's a big positive. Now, granted, they may not have a lot of on-field work, but Daniel Jones knows Jason Garrett. Jason Garrett knows Daniel Jones. He knows what makes his quarterback tick. He knows what's comfortable. So I think that bodes well for all of those parties. And I think that that relationship improved as the season progressed. What hurt the establishment of that offense and Daniel Jones's growth is, Alec, let's go back to week two. He loses Saquon Barkley. So that impacted Jason Garrett, right, from an offensive play calling perspective. You took away his best weapon. And then now Daniel Jones loses his security blanket, not just in terms of the running game, but a player that you could dump the ball off to, and then he could turn a three or four yard pass into maybe a 20 yard game. So that hurt them right out of the gates. That was number one. Then you add on the fact that Sterling Shepard was in and out of the lineup because he dealt with injuries. You had Evan Ingram have his fair share of ups and downs. He was healthy, but the execution wasn't necessarily where it had hoped. And then on top of that, once again, when are we not talking about the offensive line of the New York Giants? So, you know, you had young guys that you were implementing. Nate Solder opted out. Once again, not excuses, Alec. It's just when you ask me the question about how did year one go with Daniel Jones and Jason Garrett? Well, you were learning about one another, and then the movable pieces around you completely changed. So I think, once again, year two, do you have everybody at your disposal? So can you say, hey, for 12, 13 games, this is our nucleus. And then once again, you've added now Kenny Galladay and Kyle Rudolph, which I think should help the execution level because those are big targets that can help you in the red zone, as well as specifically for Galladay with some of those big splash plays. We talked about a lot of these offensive pieces, either coming back or signing. Just give it just quickly before we move on to some of the receivers. How huge is it knowing Barkley's coming back? You hit it right on the nose, Alec. It's funny because every time I have conversations with individuals, whether it be on Sirius XM, on NFL Radio, or Mad Dog, I bring up the fact that the Giants had just 27 touchdowns in 2020. But do the math. 27 touchdowns in 16 games? That's crazy, right? But let's take it a step (laughs) further, Alec, right? Let's not stop there. They had actually technically 25 offensive touchdowns because two were defensive scores. So that's not a product of your offense. So 25 offensive touchdowns in 16 games. Who's going to win consistently in the NFL if that's the law of average? So right away, that is a product of not having Saquon Barkley in your lineup. And when you now add Saquon Barkley, okay, you're adding versatility in terms of the run game and the receiving game. So by default... You improved without doing anything to your roster, Alec, because you now added a healthy weapon who's, once again, a weapon, not just a running back. It's not right to classify Saquon Barkley as a running back because he could do a lot more than just run the football. So to answer your question, yes, I think it helps them tremendously because, as I said, it happened fast and furious at the beginning of the season. You immediately removed a key guy. Now you add him into the mix on top of, of course, what you did in free agency. So when you look at this, who Daniel Jones can be throwing the football to, I mean, you added Kenny Galladay, John, John Ross, Darius Slayton is coming back. You know, this looks like has a pretty dynamic receiving core. If they can all stay healthy, just talk about how the addition of a big-bodied receiver like a Kenny Galladay is going to completely change this offense. Well, it's huge, Alec, because of the fact that you could argue since Daniel Jones came aboard, hell, I'll go back to when the Giants last had Plexigo Burris. I mean, that's really the last time that you could say the Giants had a guy that's going to win the 50-50 balls that are going to go up in the air, and you feel, hey, your wide receiver is going to help your quarterback win, and also just a big target that somebody has to account for. Now, I know a lot of people are listening to this, and they're saying, well, wait a minute. The Giants had Odell Beckham, and they absolutely did, and I'm not Mm -hmm. surpassing Odell Beckham, and Odell Beckham was a true playmaker, but I'm talking about somebody coming in the mold, Alec, of that tall, big target that could be a vertical threat, but at the same time, you could throw the ball up to him. You like his chances. Kenny Galladay, statistically, was very strong among some of the top wide receivers in the NFL, if you go back the last three or four years, in winning those 50-50 balls. And that's what Daniel Jones needs. Now, you mentioned Darius Slayton, who was in the lineup all of last season, but he wasn't fully healthy because he was dealing with some bumps and bruises. So you now have two guys that could stretch the field with Darius Slayton and Kenny Galladay. Sterling Shepard is your intermediate guy 
and he can break away here or there for a big time play. And then Evan Ingram, who also gives you more size on top of Kyle Rudolph. So I know I'm throwing out a, not a lot of names, but the goal is here. You spread the wealth and you give defensive coordinators, Alex, something to think about. I think if you go back to the Giants last season, and once again, this was a product of a lot of injuries that you and I have just spent a bulk of this conversation on. When you take all of those weapons out, if I'm a defensive coordinator, I'm playing the Giants last season, who am I worried about? Well, you could say I'm a little bit concerned about Evan Ingram because of his athleticism, so I may want to focus in on him. You're a little bit worried about Sterling Shepard because of his breakaway speed, but once again, outside of those guys, nobody puts fear in the eyes of opposing defensive coordinators, and I don't think most defensive coordinators said, we've got to double this guy. Now, all of a sudden, we move the calendar to 2021. Now you're giving opposing defensive coordinators a reason to double Kenny Galladay, to have to think about the chess pieces of how they want to utilize defensive backs. So that, to me, on paper, is the biggest way the Giants have changed. Now, they're going to have to go out and prove it, Alec, okay? You don't just win football games based on all these lovely names on paper. The execution needs to come through. But I do think from a schematic standpoint, from a strategic standpoint, it does make opposing defenses think twice about how they want to go about their business. So uh, last question for the, um, for like the targets, um, Kyle Rudolph was a longtime member of the Minnesota Vikings, very productive, obviously injuries has affected him towards the end of his career, but uh, how can you see him coming into the offense? Could you see them doing two more, two tight end sets, kind of put more pressure on Evan Ingram and just talk about his addition to the team. Well, first of all, I think the two tight end set is a great point. And you don't have to look so far because if you go back to last season, first of all, Jason Garrett loves to utilize multiple tight ends. Just go back to his Cowboys days. I know everybody focuses on Jason Witten, but think about Blake Jarwin had a tremendous amount of success and a few other guys that flashed here or there. So there was a game, actually. It's funny you brought up the tight end alignment because I think this relates to what we're talking about. They were playing the Seahawks. Daniel Jones was hurt. He did not play. And Colt McCoy stepped in, and they ran the ball down the throats of that Seattle defense. And the way they did it, Alec, was they utilized not one, not two, three tight ends. So you can never have enough tight ends on this roster for Jason Garrett. And I do think the addition of Kyle Rudolph, who led the Vikings in touchdown receptions for many seasons, even when they had the Adam Thielens and the Stephon Diggs, because he's a big body target. He can win the jump ball, former basketball player. They're going to put those guys on the field, to your point, multiple times. They'll have Kyle block because Kyle was a big blocker for Dalvin Cook and even Adrian Peterson. If you go back to all the Vikings running backs and you can list a few other guys. So they'll have Kyle block. They'll have Evan Ingram run routes. They may have Evan block, which may not be his strong suit, but th this will give the defenses different looks. They'll have Kyle run. They have Caden Smith, another under the radar tight end. Levine Toilolo was a player that also is still on board. He's going to tap into that to answer your question. He's not going to say we have one tight end and we're just going to overemphasize him and utilize him for 95% of the snap. They're going to mix and match. So that gives them extra versatility with respect to what Rudolph brings to the table. And then in addition, they struggled in the red zone, Alec. They had flashes. They went through stretches where they did well. They were able to punch it in. But when you have 27 touchdowns overall, 25 on offense, clearly you're struggling in that regard. So I think Kyle helps them in red zone execution. You get within the 10-yard line even, you could throw it up to Kyle Rudolph and you have confidence he can win those 50-50 one-on-one battles. So for those who listened to me do a lot of draft coverage last year, I was all in on Andrew Thomas, who you guys selected with the number four overall pick in last year's draft. Before we move to the other side of the football, our, um, we say it was a rocky beginning. Things did turn around for Thomas towards the end. How confident are you, how confident are you in the left tackle going into year two? Well, I think that's pretty much a fair summary where he had his troubles at the early goings of the season. I think the second half of the season, he got more and more comfortable. And he improved. I think a big part of it was also the left guard changed a lot during the course of last season, Alec. And like anything else, the relationship between the left guard and the left tackle can't be dismissed and overlooked. You want to know that those two guys are on the same page. And Will Hernandez started out there. Then he unfortunately caught COVID. So they brought in Shane Lemieux, another young guy. And I think over time, Andrew Thomas needed to adjust to the NFL and the speed of the various rushers, and on top of that, get used to who was playing next to him. So that's, I think, part of the reason why maybe his play improved as you got into the second half of the season. As far as the confidence is concerned, 
hey, they need to continue to develop him, Alec. They need to keep him in the lineup. And Nate Solder's coming back. Matt Pear was another early round pick in the third round. They took him out of UConn. He got some snaps, but he played the least amount of snaps compared to some of the other young offensive linemen. So I could see them going with Nate Solder or Matt Parrott at right tackle. Whoever doesn't win the battle becomes the swing tackle, but I don't think they're going to rotate Andrew Thomas. I think the goal is you want him to get as many snaps as possible at the left tackle position because that's your future guy. You utilize, to your point, a very high first-round pick. I don't think you want to all of a sudden say, now we're going to play the game of musical chairs. That doesn't help the development. And they could very well address that position in the draft by bringing in somebody who could play guard and tackle and rotate him. I wouldn't rule that out. But no, to answer your question, Andrew Thomas is the guy at left tackle. I don't really think that's much up in the air at this point. So when you go to the defensive side of the ball, your big addition this offseason was adding a Dory Jackson from the Tennessee Titans. Looking at your secondary, Bradbury, Peppers, Ryan, McKinney, Jackson, it looked you guys got some ta talented secondary. Just talk about the addition of Jackson and how he changes things for your secondary. Well, the key phrase based on all of the names you just threw out there, Alec, is versatility. Yep. And it goes back to Patrick Graham, who should be a name you're familiar with because he was a former New England Patriots member of the coaching staff. He's now the Giants defensive coordinator. If you look at his scheme, he loves to move pieces around. He doesn't necessarily take one guy and say you're only a corner or you're only a safety. So the common theme within this secondary specifically, forget about the guys up front here for a second, is – all of them are interchangeable in terms of their position flexibility. I don't think that's a coincidence. You look at Xavier McKinney, who they drafted out of Alabama in the second round last year. He could play in the slot at corner. He could play safety. He could play up on the box. He could play back. Logan Ryan, who they brought in, another former Patriot. No surprise. You bring in guys you're familiar with. So mm -hmm. you're going to hear a lot of former New England guys, as you can attest to. He could play cornerback and safety. Jabril Peppers in the box deep down the field as a center fielder. Darnay, Darnay Holmes, a young rookie out of UCLA, is another guy that has some position flexibility on the outside and the inside. And then Adoree Jackson, to bring it back full circle to what you were talking about, well, here's another player that has experience on the outside, and he has experience in the slot. He doesn't nearly have as much experience in the slot as he does outside, but throwing him in there, it's not like, oh my God, wow, you're throwing him into a situation he's uncomfortable with. So a Dory Jackson falls into line in what Patrick Graham is preaching on the back end. He's going to show offenses, different mixes and matches. He's going to line guys up sometimes on the outside. He's going to line them up on the inside. So that I think was a big reason why they signed him. I think also the fact that Logan Ryan, who's the vocal leader of the secondary played with him in Tennessee. And I think he spoke very highly of him. So that was another factor, but Opposite James Bradbury last season, who was their big splash in free agency, they brought over from Carolina, had a very strong campaign and ultimately made the Pro Bowl. They didn't have a stable force, Alec, on the opposite corner. They rotated guys. They had some young guys. And I think going into free agency, if they weren't sure whether or not they could grab somebody in the draft, then they may have an opportunity to do that with a guy like, let's say, Patrick Sertain, Sertan, excuse me, or... J.C. Horn, just two top corners that I would throw out there. They wanted to address that in free agency. And I think they did that because a Dory can line up on the outside with James Bradbury. And you feel good about those two getting the bulk of the snap. So once again, I know we covered a lot of territory. Why? Because there's a lot of versatility back there. But a Dory gives them something to toy with there. Awesome. Well, obviously, the NFL draft is just a, is a week from today. And what would you say the Giants draft needs are heading into next week? It's funny you ask that question because the Giants just had a press conference with the media in which GM Dave Gettleman and their director of college scouting, Chris Pettit, spoke to the media. And you always try to read into the press conference right every year. OK, well, what exactly are the Giants willing to unveil versus what are they keeping close under their sleeves? And I don't know if we learned an overwhelming amount. I will say this. I found the most interesting statement that Dave Gettleman made. When going through the offseason, he said is talking to the coaching staff with free agency in the draft was trying to shore up the linebacker position. He said that was an emphasis compared to maybe previous seasons, getting to know what Patrick Graham looks for in a linebacker, what Joe Judge wants in a linebacker. And they did bring in some linebackers, 
guys that could play off the edge and on the interior in free agency. But the reason I throw that out is at 11, there's a chance a guy by the name of Micah Parsons could be available for them at Penn State. He's a versatile player. I know there's some questions about can he play on the outside, but I do think there's versatility there. And my ears perked up when I heard Dave Gettleman throw out the focus is on linebacker and you put two and two together. So Micah Parsons is a guy I wouldn't rule out. I wouldn't overlook. We go back to corner with a Patrick Sertan. If he's out there, the value may be too good for them to pass up, even though, as we just discussed, Alec, they already brought in a Dory Jackson. I also wouldn't rule out an offensive lineman or Rashawn Slater who could play guard and tackle. That would make sense because they're still trying to shore up the interior of the offensive line. And then wide receiver, of course, just because you brought in Kenny Galladay and you have Sterling Shepard and you have Darius Slayton, the latter two have been a little bit banged up. If a Devontae Smith is out there, if a Jalen Waddell is out there, once again, the value may be very good to want to all of a sudden take that direction and bring in more depth. I don't think the Giants are in a position where they could say they're a complete roster. I think there's still room to work with in terms of what happens if a guy gets hurt. Who are you confident then coming in and answering the call? They were hit by a lot of injuries. We talked about that with Saquon Barkley. So I know I gave you a lot of different options, but I think the Giants helped themselves in free agency, Alec, to answer your question, where I don't think they're going into the draft saying, we're in desperation mode. If we don't address this one position, we're in trouble. That's a good position to be in because it gives them some flexibility. So if, if you a perfect situation, you know, the perfect giant prospect at number 11, obviously you can't say someone like Trevor, like a real, uh, but like of the guys you just mentioned, you know, Horn, Sertan, Mike, Micah, and Smith, which one would you prefer to get drafted? If all, well, if all four of them are available, there's likely someone to be taken, but in a perfect world. Well, I think Micah Parsons or Patrick Sertan would be my top two choices in terms of that alignment that you just laid out, because I think that while this defense flashed last year and played really good football down the stretch, I'm not a believer, Alec. This is not to say that I don't have confidence in Patrick Graham and that group, but I'm not a believer that you just assume you carry over where that unit left off and they pick up right away. I think that now, keep in mind, the rest of the teams in the division in the NFL now has a lot of film on what Patrick Graham likes to do on defense. So the reason why I'm going back to that is I don't think this defense is at a point where you say it's a top 10 group. There's no doubt about it. They're going to give a lot of teams trouble. I think there's room for them to add a few more playmakers. And I think Parsons and Sertan are players that would come in year one and I think would make a significant impact. I like Devontae Smith. I don't buy the critics that are worried about his weight. I think that he proved he stayed healthy in college. He played double-digit games each of the last three seasons, and he got separation, and he dealt with guys jamming him at the line. So I think people are too caught up in the weight. I just don't know at this point if bringing in a wide receiver at 11 is the most significant playmaker slash need that the Giants want to address. So that's why I would lean a little bit more towards defense slash offensive line before maybe I'd go in the direction of a wide receiver. Awesome. Well, let's um, we'll talk about your general manager, Dave Gettleman, who's been in charge for a couple of years now. Just talk about a little bit about his draft history and uh, some of the, and just how, do you think he's, how confident are you going into this draft that he can get the right guys for the pieces for this team going into next year? Well, you look at the fact that they drafted Saquon Barkley in 2018, and then you take into consideration Andrew Thomas last year. If we're just to examine some of the recent first round picks. I know DeAndre Baker didn't work out because they parted ways with him. 2019, they had three first round picks. So they also grabbed Dexter Lawrence, defensive lineman out of Clemson, who I think is now going to have even more of an opportunity for some flexibility because Dalvin Tomlinson left in free agency to sign with the Vikings. And then, of course, they took Daniel Jones. So they addressed weapon slash running back with Barkley, hopeful future quarterback in Daniel Jones, and a guy that's going to protect the future quarterback, and Andrew Thomas. I don't know if there's anything to read into that, Alec, other than you addressed multiple different positions over the last few years. So I wouldn't say, well, he only focuses on this area. I know a lot of people are focusing on the fact that Dave Gettleman doesn't have a tendency to trade back because he's never done that, whether it be with Carolina and the Giants. But my argument would be, I think the Giants are going to be in a great position to draft a playmaker at 11. 
So I don't understand why everybody's so caught up in they should worry about getting better value. If you're on the board and you like two guys that are there, you take the player at 11. You don't even think about it. So what? So you get an extra second round pick? What exactly is the extra second round pick going to do? Are you going to guarantee me that the extra second round pick is going to get you a Hall of Famer? I would say the chances of the guy at 11 impacting your roster immediately or in the next four years is far higher than you getting an extra second round pick and that second round pick all of a sudden wow you. So the whole narrative about he never trades back, I think is a little bit overkill and people are just looking for something to talk about because they're so damn bored about talking about the draft for the last few months, myself included. But getting back to once again, your question, I think he's brought in some playmakers over the last few years in round one. And now the goal is adding depth and helping your quarterback. And the way you help your quarterback is you protect your quarterback or you shore up the defense because the defense can certainly help out the offense. So I wouldn't necessarily say that he loves or favors offensive linemen or defensive linemen over various other positions because, once again, he's gone across the board. I think he's going to be in a position in all likelihood at 11, assuming they stay there, and you assume that there's going to be at least three quarterbacks that are taken off the board before the Giants select that. They're going to be able to choose between, I would say, two guys that they like. And that, I think, once again, puts them in a good position to come up with somebody that's going to help in year one. Well, before we let you go, the state of the division, you know, obviously Dak is coming back for the Cowboys. The Washington football team has one of a very, very solid defense, the team that won the division last year. Philadelphia is going through some coaching changes and likely going to have uh, Jalen Hurts take over as the starting quarterback before we're about a week away from the draft. Obviously, some impact guys could change a few things. But where do you think the Giants stand right now with the rest of the teams in the NFC East? Yeah, it's a fascinating division, Alec, because of the fact that a 7-9 and nine team won the division last yeah. season, and that's not happening again. Okay, I'll go on no the way. record saying nobody is going to feel good about seven wins and thinking they're going to win the division. But there's also not a juggernaut, which you alluded to, in this division, meaning there's not a team that I look at and I say, oh boy, good luck. I think every team, if I was to go down the list, has some things you like, and then some things that they need to work on. Case in point, Washington, I love their defense. What happens on offense with the quarterback position? Is Ryan Fitzpatrick going to be the guy? They're going to lean on Kyle Allen or Taylor Heineke. I love the addition of Curtis Samuel. I think they got a lot of weapons, but the execution of the quarterback is going to tell an awful lot. Dallas, love their offense, love the return of Dak. You get some offensive linemen back. The defense right now is a huge question mark. We'll see if they can shore that up in the draft as well as some of the pieces they added in free agency. They have a new defensive coordinator, though, in Dan Quinn. The Giants, you like what the defense is bringing back. You like the flashes that group showed. You like what they did in free agency, but I got to see it on offense before I crown the offense coming and making huge strides. And then Philadelphia is more of the question marks across the board because you got a new coaching staff. You had trouble on the offensive side of the ball because of the various injuries on the offensive line. You got a young quarterback. And then, of course, the defense is bringing back some pieces. I like what they're working with up front, but the secondary is still a work in progress. So where the Giants land based on all of that, if you were to ask me, I think Washington is the team that has stability and the most balance in the division. That's where I would rank them. And I always give the team that won the division a slight edge. Then. You really can flip a coin between the Giants and the Cowboys, as far as I'm concerned. Philly, I think, right now is the fourth team because we're most unsure about that group. So the Giants are going to be battling it out for the second spot slash third spot. And they certainly have the capability to compete for the division title because a lot will depend on that offense. That offense was anemic at times last year, Alec. It put so much pressure on the defense. Do I think they're going to be able to score more points? Yes, based on what they brought in on paper. How could you not think like that? But once again, we've also seen years where teams make these splashes in free agency. People have these dreams of grandeur. We're going to put this guy on the field, that guy. And then it doesn't always add up. And also, a number of the guys that are on offense also have some issues with durability, Alec. For example, you can't tell me Saquon's playing X amount of games. You can't tell me Sterling's playing X amount of games. Kenny Galladay did not play much last year because of the hip injury too, right? So once again, I'm bringing that up, not to be a Debbie Downer, I'm being realistic here. You can't throw a parade after free agency. You just can't do that. 
So the Giants, in fairness, once again, second best team, third best team in the division with the upside of certainly battling for the division title. Lance, final question. Uh, how can our listeners follow you on social media and when can they listen to you on uh, multiple Sirius XM stations? Well, they can follow and interact with me on Twitter at Lance Meadow. One word, last names, M-E-D-O-W. There's no A in that last name. We always like to emphasize that. And as far as where you can hear me and follow me, well, with respect to the Giants, I host a daily talk show, Big Blue Kickoff Live. That's on Giants.com. And then once the season starts, I'll be on the Giants radio network before, in between, and after every game. And then I'm heard on Sirius XM. I host various shows on NFL radio, Channel 88 as well as Mad Dog Sports Radio Channel 82. The most consistent shows are Saturday, Sunday mornings on Mad Dog from 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. Eastern. That's Sports Saturday and Sports Sunday. Awesome. Well, Lance, I cannot thank you enough for taking the time out of your day to join me on the show. Well, it's always great catching up, Alex. I appreciate you having me on and uh, look forward to our conversations in the future. Thanks so much. Awesome. Well, that's going to be it for this episode of The Alec Walt Show. I'm Alec Walt alongside Lance Meadow. What do you guys think of the Giants heading into the 2021 NFL Draft? Feel free to comment that below. Also, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to Down the Block Sports for more of my exclusive content. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in, and we'll see you very soon.